Instagram and Twitter, Snapchat, Vanish Today. What else would you have? Is. A lot of people don't know who you are, yeah. and I'd like to get my viewers to understand who you are and what made you great and how you got into real estate. Um, who are you? Shit, well, um, thanks for having me, first and foremost. You know, it's my, my guy. Um, so a little bit about me. <clears throat> I grew up in a small town like three and a half hours north of Los Angeles called Tulare. So it's a very small town, you know, more cows than people type scenario. Um, you know, I graduated high school in, in 2003. I have an older brother, and I kind of got into sports based off of that. I was uh, I never played football, so imagine you know I played in the NFL for, for for a matter of years. But you know, growing up, I never played football because I was always too big to play. I was the chunky kid growing up, so I played football in sixth grade. But I had to play with the kids two years older than me because I couldn't play with the kids my age. I weighed too much. <laughs> like you, like you, like you were overweight. I was overweight, like, like chunky. Yeah, I was, I was, the, I was the fat kid. You know what I mean? Like quote unquote, the fat kid. I was him. He was me. Um, I remember sixth grade, my very first year playing football. We were playing this team called Strathmore, and I went out there and I got a stinger in my right shoulder. And you know, what I mean, I don't know if you know what a stinger is, but it's like a, it's a, it's a pain, a shooting pain after you hit somebody. Like oh, and my shoulder went numb and it was hurting. <clears throat> and at that moment, I was like, man, football ain't for me. So seventh grade, I didn't play at all. Didn't even try. Eighth grade comes around. I'm like, okay, let me give this a go. You know, my brother was in high school now, and he was making a name for himself. And, you know, I'm the little brother. I was like, I want to do this shit, too. I want to play. So I went out. And so the weight limit was 164 pounds. I weighed 182. Wait a minute. <laughs> you weighed 182 pounds? 182 pounds. And I mean, a muscle, it, right? <laughs> really? <laughs> what were you eating, dog? Everything. 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 I was uh And what was your brother's weight? Oh, my brother was the 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 athletic dude, you know what I mean? The short, six packed, you know what I mean? Not short, but you know, the six pack abs, athlete, you know, fast, runs track, football, bat, all that shit. And so I'm the little bro. I was always athletic. Like I was always athletic. I played uh ba I mean baseball. Baseball was my shit. But I was just chunky. So I, anyway, I, I long story short, I missed the weight by three pounds. I had I had a month to lose the weight, didn't lose it. I missed the weight by three pounds. So now going into my freshman year, clean, you know, clean slate, anybody can play. So that was my freshman year of high school was the first time I <clears throat> played football legit. And then, you know, things just started, you know, progressively picking up from there. I just, I, I hit a growth spurt. And so I went from 5'8", like 180 to six foot. 185 in a matter of three and a half months. Wow. You know what I mean? So from after my freshman year football season going into basketball season I just hit a massive growth spurt and then you know the rest is history and then uh did girls I, start noticing that's you at the that thing time? that's the thing that's bruh you felt good about yourself you know you start feeling a little feeling a little decent some girls start recognizing you and shit you're like I've been here though you know what I mean like I've been here but now you recognize oh my me. god like, you got oh. the ego Okay. The ego came. Not really the ego. Just you felt more good like, about yourself. You felt though, right? good about yourself, and you're like you're getting more, you're getting recognized a little more now. But like, like, like I thought, like I was, I was, I, mean, I was, I was here a month ago. You know what I mean? Like I was the same dude a month ago. But now all of a sudden, you got a six pack. You know what I mean? Right? Because I didn't grew a little bit. Now, okay, whatever, fuck it. You know what I mean? So that happens. What'd your brother think about that? <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> competition's on, right? You, you pulling his ladies now, right? Because I mean, not nah, nah. He was he's still the OG. My brother to this day is still that's my guy. Like I love him to death. You know what I mean? It was a uh, yeah. My brother, he, there ain't no there ain't no competition there. That's my guy. I want to bring it back to something because I read something that there is a Zach Dials Day in your hometown. <laughs> so there is. So you know, um, you know, we could segue to that. You know, after high school, I ended up having to go to junior college. I went to Fresno City Junior College for two years. After that, transferred to Kansas State University, went there for two years. And so in 2007, I ended up getting drafted into the NFL, seventh round draft pick. You know what I mean? Like Seventh round? Seventh round, the last round of the draft. Wow. Seventh round, pick 218. Um, like I remember that day like it was yesterday. You know, you start around like the mid-sixth round, you start fielding calls from teams. I'm like, yeah, we're going to bring you in as like a priority free agent, this, that, and the third. You're like, fuck. Like, I wanted to get drafted, you know what I mean? Like, 
at this at that stage of my life, I yeah. was like, shit, I want to get drafted. Fuck it. You know what I mean? But now I'm getting these, you know, free agent calls, this, that, and the third. I'm like, cool, whatever. And so I was at my best friend's house in Fresno, California. I'm sitting on the couch. <clears throat> We're watching the draft. And the biggest mistake I made is I watched the entire day. You know what I mean? Because I think that day the, the draft started in like the fourth round. And I sat there and watched every fucking pick, which was stupid. Were you, was, were you sweating at that point? I mean, it was dumb. You know what I mean? Because in 2007, the draft was long as fuck. You know what I mean? And now you're starting to see guys get drafted from schools you never heard of. You know what I mean? Like Midwestern State in mid middle of nowhere, Kentucky. Like, like I didn't even know they had a football team. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? How this dude getting drafted in the fourth round in my position? Like, fuck, I'm all Big 12. So let's let's fast forward to something. Yeah. And the phone's ringing. You don't know who it is, mm-hmm. right? And you pick up the phone, and what happens at that I point? hung up. You hung up on them. I hung up. You hung hung up on Destiny. <laughs> I hung up all on right. the text, and so I'm at the house. And my, my friend, my eight, you know, so I get this 832 number calls me out of nowhere. So I'm like, man, fuck, I don't know who this is. So I answer it. Hey, Zach, how you doing? And at the same time, my agent was calling me. So I was like, fuck this. I'm, I'm going for the person that I know. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Click. You know what I mean? I'm like, Brian, what's going on? At the same time, I'm talking to him. My best friend is tapping me on my shoulder. He's like, Zach, Zach. I'm like, dude, what, what's going on? He's like, look at the TV. So I look up at the TV. And it says Houston Texans select Zach, you know, Zach Dials, linebacker, Kansas State, oh, round man. seven, pick twelve. Brian, what happened? Did I get it? congratulations, buddy? You just got I was like, oh shit, I just hung up on them. Like wow. I was like, yo, I literally just hung up on them. Are they still gonna want me? Like, what's gonna happen? Like, fuck, are they not gonna draft me now? I just hung up on them. And so they call me back and I end, you know, the rest is history. I'm out there. So the, wait, 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 hold on. Who was the first phone call you made? The first phone call I made was, of course, to my mom at that time. You know what I mean? I called my mom, then I called my brother. You know what I mean? Of course, now I'm starting to get phone calls because everybody's seeing this shit on TV. And it's like, dang, Zach, da da, whoop de whoop. I'm small town. You know what I mean? I'm the first one. You know what I mean? I'm the first one. So has that ever happened in your hometown? Uh, not, no. Nah. We had, we've had some, um, you know, Olympic gold medalists. You know, Bob Mathias, Simenis, but. Uh, we haven't had anybody, you know, get drafted at that time. We hadn't had anybody at that time get drafted. Now there's four of us, and we have a Super Bowl champion from my high school. So, you know what I'm saying? It is what it is. We out here. But but that shows you that even from a small hometown, mm-hmm. you know, hopes and dreams actually do become reality. They really do. They really do. And Because um, did you ever see yourself actually going to the NFL that's when the, you were growing up? Never did. Never did. It wasn't anything. Like I said, I didn't even start playing football until I was a freshman. So, and that's kind of the, the thing I see these days with a lot of guys, how they start getting, you know, football becomes a thing that defines them because they've been playing since the age five, six, seven, eight years old. And that's, you know, from that age, they've been told they were the best and football is in it, this, that, and third. So that's what, become, that's what defines them. So when they don't have it anymore, it's difficult for them to, to adjust to that shit. You know what I'm saying? So, but, but, you know, going back to you had, you know, you were known as a chubby, yeah. a chubby kid, right? Yeah. So... You know, what really motivated you? What changed your mindset? <clears throat> just just getting better. You know, you know what it was? Um, honestly, what it was was seeing somebody from my hometown be successful. So there was a guy that I went to high school with, which, which was probably one of – he was probably at that time the best high school football player I'd ever seen in my life. You know what I mean? But being from a small town, we didn't have a lot of the big colleges come looking. And, you know, we had the Fresno States and Nevadas. Literally, that was in UNLV. You know what I mean? Those were like the three high colleges that were recruited out of our area. So we had a guy in my, in my high school named Randy Jordan. Dude was probably the best high school football player I've ever seen in my life. And he ended up going to a junior college. <clears throat> but after that, he transferred to Kansas State. So you I'm know what that's about, right? You know what I mean? So I'm sitting here in this little ass town in Tulare, California, but now I see somebody from my town doing major work at a at a major university. You know and you mean? know Kansas State, that's that's uh, Bo Bo Jackson, right? Bo Jackson. Yeah, Kansas, right? Oh no no no, Bo Bo was well, Auburn. He was, on, he was in the Royals, right? Oh yeah yeah Royals yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Aren't you yeah. a football player? I'm a skateboarder, baseball. man. Bo Jackson, that was baseball. Royals. Oh, yeah, that was baseball. He played for the Raiders. Raiders. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, it was like he went to hey. Auburn in, in college. But that's really what kind of like jump set it. I saw, um, I saw Randy playing big time football. And at that point, I was like, oh, shit, like we're from the same town. You know what I mean? Like, and at that point, like K State became my dream school, which was weird, like, because I always got to see them play. But, you know, but always knowing that I had the drive 
but kind of seeing somebody from where I was from do it at that level. And I was a junior in high school when he, when, you know, his, when he got the case said I was a junior in high school. So I got to see this shit in, you know, 2002, 2003. I'm like, I'm watching. I'm like, damn, like, he's playing. Like, he's out there. He's playing against, like, Oklahoma, Texas. You know, they won a Big 12 championship. So I'm like, fuck. Like, he's, like, I just went to high school with this dude, you know? Like, okay. Like, let me, uh, let me tighten up a little bit. So that's why I said I ended up having to go to junior college. And then, you know, two years out of junior college, all of a sudden, I get a phone call from Bill Snyder. Like, hey, heck, how you doing, son? Bill Snyder, we want to offer you a scholarship to come play at Kansas State, and I'm like, oh shit, like Just this is real. This, you know what I'm saying? Like this is this is this is what I wanted. You know what I mean? This is crazy. But but it stems even further from that. You know, you told me a story once about you winning a spelling bee. Yeah. What is that all about? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, let's talk about this. You said you won a spelling bee. That's, so I mean, it was, that's it was, huge. It was second. I got second place and third place. So I went to the spelling bee in first grade. In first grade. In first and third grade. So in first grade, yeah, first and third. Don't, don't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't discredit my... How do you spell my... the? So, dude, that's a crazy thing. Like, like, I forgot what word it was, but I got second place. And this is the, this is the, well, this is third grade when I got third place. The word I missed was some, like, small-ass word. I didn't put, like, an H in the shit or some shit like that. But then, like, the next word was Pneumonia. The person next to me, the, after me, got pneumonia. Wow. I had no fucking idea how to spell this word. And so when the person starts spelling it, P-N, I'm back there like, <laughs> like I should have, <laughs> fuck. And then they say, you are correct. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, I was out right in time. I was out right in time because I would have butchered the shit out of that word. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I would have been in here looking real fucking stupid. Like, pneumonia with a P in front of it? Like, <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, and that was, like, you know, some shit you just don't forget. I was like, damn, I'm, I'm glad I missed my little word because if I'd had to spell pneumonia, it would have been, mom would have probably left me here. Like, <laughs> that's not my baby. That's not my child. But yeah, I got a uh, second and third place in, a, in, in, in spelling bees and. You know, I've always been a really good speller. Um, it just except for that word. Except for that, except for the word that got me, and I forgot which word it was, but I'll never forget that pneumonia word. I was like, "Oh shit!" And I was out right in time. Like that would not have, that would that would have scarred me. You know what I'm saying? Like I would probably emotionally scarred me getting in front of that crowd and misspelling the word that bad because I would have butchered that shit. Like, what was your hated. favorite? What was your favorite team that you played for? Oh, Houston, of course, Houston all day. You know, <clears throat> that's why I got drafted to. I was there the longest. And it was just, um, you know, Gary Kubiak, Gary Kubiak was our head coach. And, you know, he played in the NFL. So, you just knowing the kind of format. And he knew what – he was a player's coach. You know what I mean? So, he took care of us. Um, it's always that, that old adage, you know, the grass ain't always green on the other side. You know, when I left Houston after my fourth year, I went to – you know, I left. And you're, you're realizing, like, shit, like, it was – Things were really, really good in, in Houston. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 they treated you like a family, right? It was a hundred percent, hundred percent. Because you go other places. Like I went other places in Houston. Like, you know, every Thursday we had like a linebacker dinner. So every linebacker we'd get together Thursday night. We're on the town. We're eating, and that that would turn into like the linebackers D line and a few DB. You know what I mean? So next thing you know, we got. 15 guys, 16 guys out on the scene on a Thursday night eating, shooting the shit at a dinner. Tab comes out because that's <clears> – <throat> when it was just the linebackers, these, these dudes are some assholes. So, <laughs> like, when it was just, like, us as a linebacker group, whoever was – whoever's week it was to pay got to pick where we were eating, right? And me being a rookie, so <laughs> – <laughs> so, I, I mean, like, I was very – I was very blessed, man. Um, Where'd you take him? Like, no, I got drafted into a situation where, like, you know, I was the youngest guy in a room of all veterans. You know what I mean? And this is back when the NFL was still real. You know, this is 2007, so the shit was still, you know, as far as play on the field, you could still run through motherfuckers. Off the field, shit was different. You know what I mean? The respect adage and shit that you had for your OGs and shit like that, it's just totally different now. You know what I mean? But, uh. Like, I was very fortunate to be drafted into a situation where, you know, as a seventh-round pick, I'm in a room with, you know, a guy named D'Amico Rhymes, who is um, the rookie of the year the previous year. And so he's going on the second year, but he's already got that cachet. You know what I mean? He's a boss, and D'Amico is a fucking boss. And so there was D'Amico second year. Then we had a guy, Charlie Anderson, was in his fourth. Shantae Orr was going into his fifth at the time. Um, Wait a minute, you know – 
nobody probably knows any of these names unless. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, nobody's not. Yeah. But let me ask you this. You know, for me, who want to be a professional skateboarder. Okay. Right. And now what I I kind of listen to what you're talking about. What's that like? You had money, mm -hmm. girls, fancy cars, big homes. Yeah. I mean, you pretty much lived that lifestyle, the the fabulous, rich and the famous lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. could pretty much do anything you wanted to do in Houston. What was that like? You know, because I'm pretty sure all the consumers out there and <laughs> viewers, they want to know what that lifestyle is like too. I mean, it's fast. Uh, life comes at you fast. Um, I was drafted at 21 years old. You know what I mean? So I'm 21 a, years old. I Let's was, talk about this. What is that like? I mean, I was going to house <laughs> parties, you know, because I was out of college. Well, first off, I kind of dropped out of college, but <laughs> hey, I was still partying. But what is that like? You've had a lot of money, okay? Because a person like you coming from a hometown of Tulare, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what is? I mean, what does that income look like? Is it a hundred thousand? Is it fifty thousand? What is that like? And then to make the kind of money that you made, yeah. I mean. Some people, that's like winning the lottery, right? Yeah, no, it was a, it was, it's a very fast transition because you got to think, I'm coming from college now where my scholarship check, being that I was in Kansas, so, you know, the cost of living is different, of course. So my scholarship check was, I think, $502 a month, um, you know what I mean? So, you know, after paying your bills and shit every month, you know, about a, about a fourth of the month, you have, you know, $60 left, you know what I'm saying? So now all of a sudden... I get drafted, although I was, like, like I said, I was a seventh-round draft pick. So you signed, my signing bonus wasn't something crazy compared to, like, our first-round guy. My signing you just bonus came was, off of $500. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You, yeah. you got a, a signing bonus of 20000 you feel like you're balling because you're 21 years old. Like, my signing bonus was $56,915. After taxes, I got, like, $38,000. You couldn't tell me shit. You know what I mean? Like, you couldn't tell me shit. Nothing. The like, fuck? You, you, like, you like Soldier Boy, right? Like, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, why don't you guys just Drake? You know, what I'm like, no, like, <laughs> I had you couldn't tell me shit, bro. Like, I'm still, you know, at that, I had just turned 22, but, but you still have to make the team though. So that's the thing. That's the thing that that people don't understand. Like, yeah, I was drafted. You know, you sign a four year contract worth X amount of dollars, but you still have to make the team before you get that bread. So only, when you get drafted and you still have to get on the team. You still have to make the team. See, so I didn't know that. Yeah. So my that fifty six thousand dollars that I signed, my signing bonus, that was all I had guaranteed to me, which was thirty eight thousand after taxes. You know what I mean? So going into training camp, you're like, okay, you know, my rookie salary was two eighty five. So in order to make that salary, though, I have to make this team. I have to beat out these guys who are in here trying to, you know, put food on their children's table, you know what I mean, pay for private schools that their kids are now in. Who knows, you know, who knows what, you know, who, how many people or households these guys taking care of. And I'm coming in trying to compete with this guy for a job now. So I do that. I go out there, and <clears throat> you talk about the drive. You're 22 years old, yeah. right, at the time. Yeah. You know, and you know you have a lot of competition. Mm-hmm. What is that like? Are you laser focused saying, I'm going to get oh, yeah. on the team? Oh, yeah, laser. Because <laughs> so it was, um, it was a scenario where I, I, I got in there and I started making some plays in practice, right? I'm starting to, to be noticed on tape. And coming from college, I was that guy. You know what I mean? I'm the starter. I'm that motherfucker. You feel me? So now I get drafted. Now I'm that motherfucker. I better be playing special teams. Like, you better get really, really comfortable with your special teams coach. So now, now it's training camp. You know what I mean? I get there, it's training camp. We got our pads on and shit now. And, like, coach, you know, coach, you, hey, I need a body. I'm here, coach. Coach, I need some, I'm here. What do you need? I'm right here. So, you know, always being on tape, always being there. I need, hey, what the fuck you need? I can, so long story short, I go out there one day. This is, like, fifth, the fifth day in the training camp, my rookie year. And I've, I've been, like I said, I've been doing, I've been putting some stuff on tape. I've, you know, I've been doing well. The, the, we're, we're stretching before, before our morning practice. And the general manager comes over next to me. He, he kneels down next to me. So he's, he's talking at me, but not, you know, he's talking to me, but not looking at me. So I'm doing my stretch, and he comes down and knees next to me. He's sitting there. He, he opens up his little thing. He's like, you know what, Zach? You know, I'm just wondering when you're going to fade. And he gets up and walks off. Wow. So I'm like, you know, you could take that one of two ways. You know, a lot of guys would take that as like, oh, man, fuck, the poor little me. Like, okay, whatever. But me, I see, I see, now I know you see me. You know what I'm saying? Now I know something that I'm doing, you're watching. You know what I mean? Because you wouldn't just say some shit like that to me if you weren't impressed with something that I've been doing on tape. You know what I mean? I took that as a negative, though, right? No, like, some you, people you do. You thought you were going to drop out. You right? know what I mean? Some people do. 
You know what I mean? But not me. He literally sat there next to me. He's like, you know what, Zach? I'm just wondering when you're going to fade. Got up and walked the fuck off. Literally. And I'm sitting there, you know what I mean, doing my stretch. And I'm like, oh, okay. You, you just fucked up. Like, so, so basically what you're telling me is you were like the G.I. Jane right there. Dude, like, yeah. At that point, I was like, oh, now I know you see me. Okay. You know what I mean? That just that right there just told me that something that I'm doing when you guys are in your little office at night watching tape. Oh, 54 right here. This fucking guy. Who? That's that kid we picked in the seventh round. That's that Zach Dow's kid. <laughs> here's an, yeah. here's a, this is when I knew I wasn't shit, right? This is when I knew I was not shit. So I get drafted. I got drafted with this guy named Amobi Okoye. He was 19. Still, to this day, the youngest first-round draft pick. To 19 years old, bro. He was 19. His birthday is June 10th. My birthday is June 11th. I didn't know this wow. shit at the time, right? So now it's my It's June 11th, my rookie year. I'm, I had just turned 22. It's June 11th. I got drafted two months ago. We've been here practicing. I've been around the guys for about a month and a half now. Now it's like it's my birthday. So Koob calls us up after practice. This when I realized I wasn't shit. <clears throat> he calls up the practice. He's like, you know, we got a guy out here. You know, he's this, a special guy. He did this blase blase and his birthday. This down the third. I want him to break down the down the huddle. Who stands up? My black ass. I stand up. I'm like, okay, today is my birthday, nigga. So this this he must be talking you. about me. I stand up. This man looked me in my face. Was like, Zach, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> oh shit. I was like, Coach, today is my birthday. Oh, is it? Oh, well, I was talking about a Moby. His birthday was yesterday. Well, both of you guys called us up. I was like, oh, shit. Like, I was drafted. You know what I mean? Like, this man doesn't, he has no idea who the fuck I am. Okay, like, cool. So you start having these moments of clarity. Like, all right, that was moment number one. And then, like I said, then a training camp moment. I'm just wondering when you're going to fade. Like, oh, now I know you see me. You know what I'm saying? Like, something I'm doing has caught your attention. So now you just fucked up because now I know. So now I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to put a little extra on it. You know what I mean? I'm going to put in a little more work because I want to make this team. You know what I mean? So I'm like, fuck, okay, all right, Rick. I got something for your ass then. You want to fade? Now I'm going to pick it up a little more because now I know you see me. So it's just those kind of those kind of moments where, like, like I said, you could take that in one of two ways. You could take it as a negative. Oh, man, I don't have a chance. Or you, like For me, I was like, bitch. But let's fast forward, you know. What was it like? You got on the team, yeah. Zach, mm -hmm. right? You see all the spotlights. You run out of that tunnel, Oof. and you look, right, and there's all those lights, all those screaming fans. What was that like for the first time you're being televised on TV, you know, and you are a professional NFL player? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's surreal. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's surreal, like I said, especially coming from my background. Um, I'm like, Wow. Every, I mean, even to my last year, so from year one to year eight, I would get to every game. You know, there's an early bus and a late bus. There's an early bus from the hotel and all that type of shit. So I'm always – every time I'm on the early bus, which gets to the stadium like three hours before the game. So I'd get to the stadium. I get – I mean, I'm I'm in and out the locker room when I get there in probably like six minutes. I'm out my suit, into my warm-up clothes, and I'm just walking around the field. Like, I'd get out there and I'd walk around the field, and i just – like every stadium I went to, and I'd be like, dude, like – in two and a half hours, this shit is about to be full of people, and I'm about to be playing out here. Like, li I would literally do that every week from year one to year eight and just take it in. Like, nigga, this is, like, like literally in two and a half hours, there's going to be people out here, bro. Like, I'm going to be playing in this stadium in front of all these fucking people. That's crazy. I'm from Tulare. Like, this is, this, is, this is crazy. And now I've been doing this. You know what I mean? Year four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm like, bro, like, this is crazy. You, are, you seasoned in this bitch now. Like, you know, it's, so it's, it's kind of, it never. It, it What's never that like, old. Zach? What's that like? You have the ball, all the lights, the fans are screaming, you know, you're getting recognition. You know, your parents are freaking screaming mm. out to their TV. You could hear them almost in your helmet. Yeah. What is that like? You know, it's crazy. <clears throat> you really don't, when you're on the field in high, high tense, high, high situations, you don't even really pay attention. You don't even, all that shit is just like gray matter. Like the fans, Everybody around you, everything, because you're so focused on what's happening in front of you that, I mean, unless it's, like, super loud and you're on defense and you're trying, you're trying to hear a call or something like that, but outside of that, you don't – it's tunnel vision. Like, I'm, I'm focused on this these 11 dudes in front of me, 
and why they came out in this formation and what my defense is and what I have to do in this call. Because if this guy motions, that switches this shit up. I got to give this guy this call. I got to give that person this. And he comes back and it switches back. So you don't got time to be wondering, worried about what the fuck is going on around you. You know what I mean? Like, shit, I, if I want to continue my, to, keep, to keep having this job, <laughs> like, like, I need to be locked in on what's going on in front of me. You know what I mean? So it's, it's fun. It's, it's always great. You know, having that those the home team, you know, home crowd that you having that advantage. But when you're out on the field, you're so locked in. You know what I mean? And, and to, unless it's like after a play, you make a big play, you're gonna pump the crowd up. But in the middle of the shit, you're like, I don't hear nothing. I don't like what's the call. I right, bet. Like da 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 da. Let's go. So, so and so eight years later on. Yep. You know, you transition from being a professional NFL player mm-hmm. to real estate. Why? <laughs> so. I get this question a lot, and um, honestly, the thing about it was that that got me uber, you know, interested in real estate was now I'm around, like, a whole bunch of really, really wealthy individuals, you know what I'm saying, like a whole bunch of rich dudes, and some of them come from, you know, backgrounds where they're very, very smart, some of them were like, man, you lucky as hell, you, you're, you're, you're athletic, you know what I mean, because you stupid as shit, you know what I'm saying, like, you're dumb as fuck, you're lucky, you're athletic, that's just, but that's, that's just, that's just it. it is what it is in every every scope of the spectrum but but now i'm around these guys that have a a a shit ton of money and then you're you're then you start going to their houses and shit you're like like damn you know because i'm from a smaller town i mean small town then i go to college in kansas and now i'm in texas so so yeah so i started going to a bunch of like you know i'm around all these wealthy individuals you start going to their houses and things like that and I remember, so I had a teammate named Mario Williams, the number one overall dra- uh, pick in the draft, you know, in 2006. And I went to his estate, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm looking at this house, and it was, like, it was, it was fucking stupid. You know what I mean? He's so taking, we're talking about massive. Massive, stupid. massive. Like, he's walking me around this shit, and there's like an echo. And, you know, I'm like, Mario, like. What? Like. How? Why? Where? Like you feel like you're in a warehouse. At you know this what point. I'm saying? I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is your house, bro. Like, this is where you live, my nigga. Like, okay. Like, you have tracking devices on your children, <laughs> like, like your, your your girl. And you know, what I'm saying, knowing the, the 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 scope of our 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 schedule and shit, I'm like, bro, how the hell did you have enough time to find this? Like, what are you? This is crazy to me. So that kind of start that started getting me more and more interested in it. And and like I said, it's just it's not being stupid, knowing your network. You know what I mean? Like my network now, I'm around a bunch of wealthy dudes. You know what I'm saying? And and so that's kind of how it segued into my life after football because that was like year two. That wasn't like '08 when I went to that dude's house. Wow. And so at that point, it started festering in my mind. Okay, oh, oh, really? You know, being a real estate, a realtor found you. a real estate agent. I didn't know what that was at that time. I'm like, okay. I mean, I had a realtor who find my, you know, I, mean, I actually le- was leasing an apartment with one of my teammates, so I didn't have a realtor and things at that point yet. So that's how I kind of, that's how I got like interested into the the business. The reason why it made more sense was it was different. You know what I mean? Again, like I said, it was different, <laughs> like, um, and it was, and it's still lucrative and it's still competitive. And so, two, year two comes around. You start yeah. seeing all these massive mansions, mm-hmm. you know, all your peers out there and how they can afford it because you know it's expensive. You're yeah. leasing an apartment and you're like, wow, yeah. Mario, how did you afford this property and who found you this property? And so it kind of struck your interest. You're like, well, somebody found you this property and how much was it? So you're kind of interested in the price and oh, yeah. the luxury of it. And- oh, well, well, no, no, I was never worried about price. You don't, you don't never, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I, I, yeah, you know what I mean? You know, I, I know how he afforded it. You know what I mean? I'm like, we were teammates. I know how a motherfucker afforded this shit. You said number one draft pick in 2006? In 2006, the year before me. What was that like for him? Like, that's how much was that did he make? Oh, God, I don't even remember. At that time, that's when contracts. But he was a DN. So, like, if he had been a quarterback, he probably would have made more. But because he was a defensive end, then I think they – I forgot what he – I think, I think he, that house, though. I think he made I think his rookie deal was something like like twenty six million guarantees and shit like that. Two thousand six, he's balling. Yeah, right. Yeah, so in oh eight, you say you got you got in, but you got a fifty six. My that, that so look at the transcripts there, like <laughs> like twenty six million to my fifty eight thousand. You think the owner cares about me? You know what I'm saying? When he's got this guy on the hook for twenty six m. This little fifty six thousand, he doesn't even see this shit leave his bank account. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't, he's not worried about me. 
but, right. but but you're paying attention and you're paying oh, yeah. attention to a guy named Mario Everything. has a huge mansion Everything. and you're starting to see how it's all kind of unraveling and you're like wow how does this person afford this well you kind of know how he's yeah, affording yeah, you yeah. saw obviously publicly but you know you're seeing on I want to say the other end you're saying mm-hmm. you know maybe I'm a little more interested on this real estate because this has had to have been a pretty expensive pad here I mean yeah that aspect I mean even then I didn't know anything about like commission splits and things I just knew I know these guys. I know the time crunch that we have. And so, like, how did you, you know what I mean? Like, how did you, you know what I mean? So you had somebody working with you that was able to do these things for you and things like that. The realtor was able to set these things. I mean, yeah, of course, commission and splits like that. If you know the right people, you're going to be able to sell, you know, high-end properties and things like that. You know what I mean? But at that time, I didn't know anything how commissions broke down and things. I'm just seeing a guy that I know in this big-ass house and wondering how the hell he had time to even do this shit. Like, when? Like, how, bruh? So, just understanding that nuance of it, as far as, like, dealing with, like, athletes and entertainers and things, knowing the time crunch of what their schedules are actually like, and knowing that sometimes motherfuckers ain't gonna answer your phone call. You know what I mean? So, you, you look at that and you say, all right, I understand that there's a time crunch, and I understand that we, you, there's a professional that connects you to that property. At that point... Did it trigger something saying, you know, I need to get my real estate license. How did it become where you got your license and you wanted to be that person that found these athletes' homes? Because um, so <clears throat> so now you trans you you fast forward a few years. My brother is a high school football coach, right? He has been out here. He actually coached at Crespi High School in Encino. I think my brother's been out here for like eight years now coaching. So around 2010, 11, my brother moved out here to L.A. And started coaching in this area. So now it's off season. I'm coming out here. You know what I mean? So I'm out here in LA and Southern California with my brother and things like that. And I'm starting to see a bunch of the guys that I know are out here in LA all the time. You know what I mean? I'm like, damn, like everybody like off season, these guys are out here in LA. Like, oh, okay. All right. So you start you just start paying attention to this shit. You know what I mean? And you're in the run, you're in the locker rooms now and you 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 hear guys talk about their off-season plans and where they're going and things like that. And, you know, the, the basis of people are, you know, it's like Miami, L.A., you know? So I'm like, okay, all right, cool. I'm like, being from California, I'm from California, you know what I mean? So I was like, okay, it makes more sense to me to go back because I was originally going to move back to Houston and start doing things. But so now so now that I've been – I got to see my brother out here and see how, you know, guys that are in my profession move around in the off-season – Okay, I'm like, all right, you know, it's like 2011, 2012. I'm like, it's starting to, things are starting to formulate. I'm like, all right, you know, at this point, it was my sixth year. You know, I probably don't have that many years left in my career. Let me start focusing now on what I want to do. I know I, I know real estate is something I want to do, but let me start actually focusing on this shit because, fuck, you know, time is of the essence. I so you, call, you called and, and said, hey, what classes do I need? Because that's not really, I, I don't know any football players that actually would call you know, and find out what courses you need to take mm-hmm. and actually apply yourself. I mean, obviously, you're the spelling bee champ, so we know you apply yourself. But in real estate, <laughs> in this market, and, you know, first off, I want to say congratulations because I know you closed a very large deal. I, I think it was in around $4 million. Yeah, 4.3. Yeah. $4.3 million. Oh, was it the first one or the one that just recently? No, I mean, this is just recently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. first deal you ever did, what was that prop? What was that price? Tag on that. Yeah, so my first ever deal was for four point three million dollars. So you did a deal your first time for four point three million dollars. Yeah. That sure, I mean, that commission was probably double than the the fifty six thousand dollars that you received on your draft pick, right? Say it again. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So we're you know you 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 figured it out that there's a lot of money in real estate. Yeah. After seeing Mario's property mm-hmm. and how big do you think that property really was? Oh, I mean, I shit, I think his house. Was around like I think he still lives there actually. Um, I want to say it was like fifteen thousand square feet, but then the guest house was like another five thousand square. Feet. I mean, this shit was massive, bro. Like, just dumb, like a compound. So we're gonna take a quick break, and after this, we're gonna talk about how Zach actually translated his business into the next level of real estate. Yep. Let's talk about real estate, Sounds football, good. and you. Let's do it. It's all on. Right. So you segue into the career of real estate. You yeah. got your license. What's that like? I mean, it was a, it's a di- it's a it's a different transition, you know for sure. Like I said, the reason why uh, real estate intrigued me because it was different. Um, <clears throat> most guys, 
you know, in that profession, I leave that profession going to, you know, coaching, broadcasting, or, like, public speaking. You know what I mean? That's, like, the, the main three things that dudes do when you retire from, from you know, NFL or any professional career at that at that status. But, um, you know, real estate was something different. It was something I knew I could still have that competitive edge. You know, at the time, you know, it was like, oh, this shit is going to be dope. I know a lot of people. Like, just because I know a lot of people, this shit is going to be it's gonna be easy. And then you realize real quick that that's not the fucking case. You know what it's I mean? It's not a team player sport like you would think. I mean, just not even in that aspect. Just the fact that because people, I know a lot of people with money and shit like that. It's like, oh, I'm going to be a, I'm gonna be the top agent because I know a whole bunch of people, this, that, and the third. But it's like, then you, you soon realize, like, bro, it ain't, you know. It don't really work like that. So your first deal, from what I can recall, mm -hmm. was with your former uh, NFL player, Joe Hayden, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joe and I were teammates in Cleveland in my last year. So, um, you know, being, being able to build that relationship and things like and that's another thing that was important. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, Joe and I were only teammates for about four months. You know what I mean? So in that four months time span, you know, I was able to leave, you know, a, a, a good enough impression on him to where when I retired, he was like, you know, this is the guy I want to work with. You know, even though he's new in the business, you know, he Joe had his his pick of any agent he could have worked with, you know, in Los Angeles at the time. And, you know, me being new into it, you know, I got a phone call from him one day. He's like, oh, yeah, me and Moo, his wife, they call him Moo, Sarah. You know, yeah, me and Moo thinking about moving to L.A., bro, this, that, and the third. It's like, oh, shit, hell yeah, let's do it. You know what I mean? So that was huge. That was, that was and Joe will forever, because they didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? He didn't have to, especially at that time in my career, but I'd only been in real estate for a matter of months. You know what I mean? So to get a phone call from him, and and they actually, you know, went through it. So we, we you know, the season ended, off season came, and, you know, they came out here. That's the reason why I got into the business, because a lot of these guys come out to L.A., whether it's just a train or not a lot of people live out here because of the cost of living and not a lot of people in that profession make enough money to live out here. You know what I mean? So that's you know, loyalty though. I yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So the fact that he, you know, a guy that has enough, you know, equity to come out here and actually live and be comfortable living out here in Los Angeles, you know, reached out to me, you know, so early in the game was, was huge. So we ended up doing that deal for four point three million dollars, and I keep, I think that's where that kind of fucked me up. You know what I'm saying? Because it was so seamless. It was the you know it's my very you know you know when I did you know when I first started working with you I did that lease for Missy Elliott and yep so that was my very first deal. But hey, that first deal you did was what twenty seven bedrooms. It was a huge right yeah. House. So it was like for thirty five you know but that but but how it went it was, remember it got shit got wait crazy. a minute wait a minute so you're saying I was your first. <laughs> right, yeah. Need source of a deal, right? So, but remember how that shit went? It got crazy because at the last second we were supposed to get that one house, but because it, it didn't go over the weekend, they didn't sign the paperwork that they gave it to somebody else. So, I had the last second find another spot, and that's when and you found weed budget. Lake. The weed was, lake, house, yeah, right? the weed, and then I found the weed lake property for them. I mean, how much was that for? For thirty five thousand dollars for like three days and shit like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's incredible. You know what I mean? So that was my very first deal. So you kind of start getting okay. This. How deals can fall apart. Oh, I remember that deal, you know right? Because I mean? didn't she say the security guard called or something or, or was looking through the garage? Somebody was looking in that so shit. So your first deal was Missy, Missy Elliott. Missy Elliott. And which was with me. And it was you. And then you did Joe Hayden. And then I did, and then I backed on my first sale was with Joe Hayden. <laughs> so, um, so that experience with Joe kind of fucked me up, right? Because it went so easy. And then all of a sudden there was a few deals. So uh, after that, I got into escrow at 2.925 with a couple that I met at an open house. We 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 get a, uh, the contract all negotiated, all everything is good, and you know it goes down to doing the uh, the walkthrough. I mean the the first home inspection, and you know the EMD. My clients never submitted the EMD, and this is you you have three days to do the EMD, right? So we're sitting at. What the, is the EMD? Because a lot of the our audience... Money, the earnest money uh, deposit. So your, your, your initial deposit into escrow. That Got starts it. up your escrow. So it's usually like 3%. You know what I mean? Of the, of the So we're supposed to do this, this EMD. Three days into it, the shit never gets done. We're sitting at the home inspection. I'm with my client. The, we're there. She pays for the home inspection. $500, all that shit. Next thing you know, that deal falls through. Have to close the escrow. And then you double back, you know, a few months after that. So that kind of hurt. I was like, fuck, whatever. So they never put the deposit yeah. in escrow. Why do you think that deal fell through? Why would they even go home? Why would they even go through the home inspection? That's what I want to know. And that's, that was my biggest question. That's when you start really learning a lot of shit about this business. You know, these were people, there were no red flags. 
it was within like I said, I met him at an open house, vetted him, you know, asked all the you know the real the, the questions you need, showed him multiple properties. They they gave me proof of funds, all that shit. You know what I mean? Um, and so when it came down to to to, to deposit the money, the first excuse was all oh, the it didn't get transferred right. And then, you know, they send me a, a confirmation number. The confirmation number is wrong. Um, Why would somebody waste your time? It's, it's weird as fuck, especially at that price point. And so... You said how much? 2.9? It was 2. right under $3 million. And then all of a sudden, that so that, that's strike two. And like I said, now I'm back and forth with the listing agent, and that shit's starting to get a little hectic. And that then, makes you look crazy as it hell. It makes me look bad. And then all of a sudden, at the last day, I'm, I'm like, look, I'll go to the bank with you guys to do this shit. And then all of a sudden, I'm, get, I'm driving to the bank. The, my, my buyer calls me. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, the IRS froze my account. I can't do anything. I'm like, what the actual fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, but why spend the money on a home inspection? Spend the money and waste your time. You know, and and just not go through the deal. That then, makes no. That makes no sense. Just disappeared. Disappeared. And who are these people? This some a couple that I met. They owned the McDonald's. You know, they had a that's you know McDonald's. We own McDonald's. Like now, thinking back in hindsight, like what's this shit? You know what I mean? So now, it gives you a lot of shit to to look for. You know what I mean? So so definitely not McDonald's. Switch it up to Taco Bell. Fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> so and then I had to end up canceling another escrow at four point two million dollars. Um, kind of the same scenario. Not really the same scenario. You get into uh, escrow, um, and it just kind of fell apart from that moment. You know, a lot of things. You know, if, you know, with, when you have deals of this magnitude, a lot everything has to fall in line. You know, everybody has to be on the same page, and not everybody with that deal was on the same page as far as like clients and you know families and things like that so it just fell apart you know what i mean so that's like seven you know almost 7.3 million dollars in escrows that i've had to cancel over the last year and a half you know and that I mean? kind of hurts because you kind know of. You, you, you're not the kind of guy to say you know i'm gonna i'm gonna be okay with this no i want to find the yeses <laughs> and i want to hit you know well, i was gonna say hit the home run but you know i I'm, i want to score that shit hurt you know what i mean because this now this is your this is so now you're in the position where, you know, you're doing deals and now, especially the magnitude we do deals and these, these other listing agents per se could be like, oh, well, this guy brings buyers, but they don't close. You know what I mean? So now you're, you can get that kind of Stigma, reputation. Yeah. So when it comes to a, a deal where you have multiple listings on it and then all my, so my name pops up, maybe the person's like, oh, well, you know, we liked it, but his buyers have a, his, his buyers have a tendency to not close. You know what I mean? So that shit, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. You know, I don't. I don't fucking like it. So you're a novice agent turning mm -hmm. into a rock star agent. What's next? It was a for me. It was a matter of just getting out there and grinding and doing the things that agents in this business do. You know, what I mean, I just didn't. I never wanted the stigma that shit got handed to you. So it was like I, I dove in. You know, the 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 door knocking, the marketing for aspect of it. The biggest thing for me where it helps is open houses. So you love open houses. I, I, I see I, you at it. every open house. Just. I, because I have to be, I have to be smarter about what I do. You feel me? Because like nobody, there's, there's not many people in the luxury market that look like me. It just is what it is. Definitely not. There's not a lot. So what I have to put myself in front of people to be like, okay, this is what I do. So how do you do that? Open houses. Like this, this is the area that I work. I like being in this area. This is, you know what I mean? So how do I break? How do I get some of this market share where it's like. Where it's, where it's valid, I have to be around. You know what I mean? I have to be seen. So I love doing open houses. You know, you're sitting in a $4 million open house. People who walk in there, whether rather be the neighbor, whoever it is, now now you're being seen. Now people, you know, because I'm doing this open house in this neighborhood. Three weeks later, you might see me over here doing an open house in this neighborhood or even on the west side. But you're different than a lot of luxury agents because you're really humble. And you, first off, a lot of the luxury agents never even made or accomplished what you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. But you're so friendly and people gravitate towards you because you are that professional, but you're also just that friendly agent out there. So it's different. You're different. You have a different approach. Yeah, you got to. So, you know, I do them open houses. I'll greet you at the door and. You know, I just, I just try to break down those barriers because, like I said, knowing the uphill battle that I already face, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, how can I, how can I break into this market, you know, without, because, you know, door knocking, bruh, I can't do it. You know what I mean? At, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon and I'm walking through Encino, like, who's going to answer the door for me? You know what I mean? Like. So you tried it. I've done it. And I've done what it. happened? You know, I've literally seen people run by doors. I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody's probably had these, but it's just. Walking. You told me one time. You told me actually one time that somebody followed you. Oh yeah. You know. I got followed you in got Sherman followed. Oaks. 
in Sherman Oaks. I had to remove myself from my vehicle to show this woman that I was non-threatening. And I was going to go look at a listing from another friend of mine who was about to list an eight and a half million dollar house. And this woman followed me around the neighborhood, bro. Like she literally, you know, pulled up behind my car and everything, followed me. So this is shit that I have to deal with. Don't you have an expensive car? That's like, what I'm. Yeah, bro. Like I'm like, but it doesn't clean matter. cut. You know, real estate professional, ex NFL player, and this person followed you. Maybe she was a fan. It doesn't matter. All they saw was, you know, I'm in, I'm in an all black car and I'm an all black dude driving around this all white neighborhood. And you had an all green <laughs> cash. You know what I mean? So it's Man. like. Like, okay, he's not supposed to be here. Fuck. So now I got a concerned citizen following me around. So these are things that you that I deal with. <clears throat> I mean, because like I said, you look at the top realtors in Los Angeles, and you look at this list, and like, shit, not a single one of them look like me. Not one. From like, from one to 200. You know what I mean? Not a single one of them looks like me. So, and, and people wouldn't even realize that, hey, you're an A student, you, you, you have a college degree, you're a professional athlete, mm -hmm. and, you know, why would you not be able to do the job? Because, yeah. and, and it's so weird for me, because when, honestly, when we were casting, I didn't realize how hard it was, and it actually made me think a little differently. And I said, why? We need to inspire yeah. other races to hop into our field. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what it's about. Yeah, no, said. 100%. Yeah, and that, like I said, a show like ours coming out, showing that light, like it's gonna be, it's gonna be eye opening because, like I said, that in Encino last week when I had the black guy tell me I was inspiring him. Imagine, you know, having a show like ours, and now you get that reach on the East Coast. Like you're you're in a state like Virginia, and you have some little kid in Virginia that thinks, oh fuck, I have no, and all of a sudden he sees somebody that looks like him on TV selling million dollar properties. And you know, you know what I mean? that that comes to this conclusion that you know, if it wasn't for you, you know, and having the hype around you. You know, and, and giving me the inspiration of coming up with an idea to come up with a, a real estate show that's actually very real, yeah. right? That's international. Mm -hmm. um, we probably wouldn't even be sitting here now and having these drinks and, you know, talking about this podcast. Yeah. So I think that, you know, there's some recognition to be spoke about with you yeah. and myself saying, hey, you know, we are different, but we can do this together. Because yeah, people don't even know, like, like this show, at first it was your idea. Like, cause this happened, this started, what, been 2015? So I, 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 I joined your brokerage in 2015, and within, like, the first week, you come to me, and we're like, hey, look, I have this idea for this show, and because, you know, you're an eight-year NFL vet, you're a good-looking guy, you're single, you do real estate. I don't think I said good-looking. No, you did all that shit. You said all that shit. You said all that shit. <laughs> that was all in his mind. You said all that shit. You know what I mean? Probably, it was probably a sales pitch. Bitch, it worked. Fuck it. But, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> like, fuck it, it worked, nigga. But... You know what I mean? Just having that kind of a background. So, like, you and I were the first, like, we're literally, like, the reason why this show is even a show. You know what I mean? So, it's kind of like to see where we are now with the whole, uh, oh, and, the, and, and the producer, and the producer and, back there. And the homie, and Sean. The, uh, <laughs> if you, but yeah, and also there's, like, a handful of people that were in the beginning stages of this, of this, of this process. And to see where it's at now. It's like it's it's very it's very surreal knowing that it's you know it's an opportunity that can definitely potentially change a lot of things, especially the the lives of others. That the are, lives of others, exactly, right? and that's that's the biggest thing about it. It's gonna show, it's gonna open up a broader net for people to be like, oh shit, I can come out here too. I can be successful too. Whether it's in L.A., whatever field, whatever. I mean, out here in L.A., it's a little different because I mean, in Atlanta, you're you know, any or Houston, these southern states is more predominantly African American. But, like, when you're out here in a state like, you know, like a Miami or a Los Angeles, where it's, like, out here, like, fuck, bro. Like, it's to, to, to show people of color doing something of this nature, of this, of this magnitude. You and know what positive. I mean? It's huge. And, so, and positive. And having a positive spin around it is, 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 is major. You know, you being great at the sport, actually just sports in general, you know, would you say real estate is a team sport or would you say it's something that you have to conquer by yourself? You can do both, actually, in this game. But it's just that when you get to the team aspect of it, there's so many fucking nuances that are annoying as shit. Especially when it comes to being like a team member and you have a broker. So Not even that, just that team leader. I mean, yeah, even so if you're a team leader. You know or I mean? a manager or something Or a manager. Else, you know I mean, because now you have people working underneath you and you got to worry about not getting sued. You know what I mean? Like, fuck, I hope nobody does anything that's going to get me fucked up. And, but as a team member, you're sitting here like, fuck, I'm going to have to give my broker 50% of my commission. And I have a split 
with my company as well. And I'm at an 80-20 split with my company. So I'm going to make 30% commission on a deal. Like, my broker is going to make more money than me. Like, what type of shit is this? Of course, that's only for, you know, your first few deals or whatever when you get in. But then it's just, you notice, like, okay, when I'm on a team, any network, any any client that I bring in is funneled into my, my broker's system. So if I decide at some point I want to leave said brokerage, I don't even get to take the people that I'm, you know what I mean? Because that's all in his system or their system. If somebody was in your shoes, okay, a new agent was in your shoes, what would you tell them? Ah, <sighs> man, just, just you have to do what's best for you. But for me, it's a lot different than everybody else because, like I said, I came into this business set, you know what I mean, you know, comfortable. So, but when you, when you, when you, when you're not at where I was at, you know, when I got into this business, it's like, fuck, you don't have like the, the, the funds to sit here and like, you're like, fuck, I got to do shit now. Like, I have to be successful now. But me, that wasn't, that wasn't the case with me. You know what I mean? So I was able to maneuver and do things differently than a lot of other people. So for me, what worked for me might not necessarily work for somebody who has to take care of a family and got kids and bills to pay and shit. Maybe a team aspect is better because, you know, you will get those leads you will get that help. You'll get those things where we'll be able to like segue off of that. But for me, I'm like, man, like I just didn't really like the team aspect of a thing because I'm sitting here, I'm building somebody else's brand. Like I'm not even building my name. Like I'm, I'm with this person's group. So anytime we do a deal, it goes under that person's group, and then my name is like right next to it, maybe. But it's just, but it's the first name of it is always gonna be the the, the, the broker's name. You know and what not I mean? your name. And, and not you're yours. the superstar. And when you're the person bringing in the business, and it's like, what the fuck? Like, so you would tell you know your audience out there that pay attention to your contracts, make sure that yeah. you're number one because you're the one bringing all the business in, mm-hmm. and it's your name. But don't you know? There's a lot of things that if you don't read these contracts, you could get taken advantage of, and a Oof. lot of people will get taken advantage of, right? Yeah, yeah. Because because especially with other agents, other agents, especially if you're new, they'll try to like sneak some shit into the description, you know, part of a contract or something. You know, a little phrase. Well, we want to keep this, this, this in the house. If you're just skimming through, you're not reading everything, or a box is clicked or checked that you didn't look at, and it's really it's an important box. Box, and you ever, everybody sign off on the shit. And then, you know, at the end of escrow thing, oh, well, this is like, no, it doesn't. Well, no, remember that box was checked. You're like, oh, fuck. So really like, read your contracts. You have to. And, and this is probably real estate. When you're signing a real estate deal to sign up with a brokerage, you know, this is probably the first time that you actually haven't had an attorney read your contract. Yeah. You don't even know what you're really signing because there's a lot of quick talking saying, just join our team. It's glitz and glamour and all that stuff. But really, you know, unless you dissect it and you yeah. have a professional that is on your side. Yeah. You know, you're not going to know what you're really signing. Exactly. It's a whole new field and a whole new sport. A whole new sport. So, like I said, my my, my background is different. So, as, as somebody coming in to this business that didn't, per se, have my background and things like that, like you said, you have to be – you have to weigh your options of what's best for you. Um, for me, it was like, you know, I like I did the team thing first, but then I realized, okay, they, this, you know, I'm getting these clients based off of who I am, you know, my cachet. So, I don't really, at this point, need the team. But if you're a new agent coming into this business, don't have that kind of a background, the team aspect might be better for you because if you're under a broker that has a shit ton of listings or a shit ton of work, now you're able to segue off of that and meet people and do them. But like I said, you just have to tread lightly because the people that you meet, if at some point, six, seven months down the line, you decide you want to leave that brokerage or that team, but that name is already funneled into this broker's system, that's that person's contact now. You know what I mean? Because you met that person under your broker's umbrella. Oh, you, this, the, that person came into that open house because my name was on it. You know what I mean? That's why the person came in. So that's even that's why you met him. Blase, blase, shit like that. It's so. not really about the broker as much as about the agent because Zach, you are a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. Regardless of being an ex-athlete, you are always going to be an athlete, mm-hmm. whatever sport or whatever employment you take. You know, so it's always going to be focused around who you are as a person because yeah. you're a winner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. It. And that's the thing too. Like, the name on the brokerage is just a name. Um, like I was, I was talking earlier, we got a guy <clears throat> that works in a guy named Jordan Cohen who does numbers, numbers, massive amount of numbers, and he works for Remax. You know what I mean? Like, he's a nice guy too. And he's not. Yeah, he's like he's one of the the main guys that used to pick, like, still picks up my phone. Like, I would come in, I would get, in, I got into this business, so he reach out to the heavy hitters, heavy hitters. I reached out to damn near all of them. One of them answered the phone. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't take calls like this. Click. 
You know what I mean? He's so, a nice guy. You know what I mean? But then Jordan, you know, I'm calling Jordan, and he, he, he'll, he'll take my phone call. He'll stay on the call with me. You know, he'll – all those things. So I'm like, okay, Jordan, I fuck with you because I've, I've – re- like, when I first got into the business, I mean, I even tried to do a – um. Like a like a like like a teaching seminar. I paid for the classes and everything with one of the high one of the top brokers at the time. Like a seminar, took my money, never got the classes. Wow. You know what I mean? It was like thirty five dollars, but it's the principles. Like I paid the shit, but never got the never got the information I paid for. So it's crazy. Um, where do you see yourself the next five years? I mean, just growing. You know, we got this uh this the show coming out. So just taking taking that in stride, taking the opportunities as they come. You know, still with the hat company, you know, this that's growing every 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 year as well. We're in a whole shitload of stores, you know, Lids, Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, all that stuff. And just business wise, just, you know, real estate wise, just continue to grow in that and get better. Cause there's a lot of things that I don't know yet because I haven't experienced them yet. It's just what it is. You know what I mean? So once you start, you know, getting into more and more shit like that and just growing every day in this business and just being the best realtor that I can be for myself and for my clients, man. So that's that's the goal, and, and just and just being an uh, inspiration. Well, having this TV show out, would you ever think about opening your own brokerage? Of course, of course. Um, if that's what it comes to, you know, uh, you know, business. You know, this show happens, business starts getting like stupid, crazy, and things like that. Of course, I'm def- That is 100 percent going to happen. Like you heard it here first. It is 100 percent going to happen. So, Zach, where can people find you online? Well, I have a, uh, I have Twitter. It's just Zach Dials, Z A C D I L E S. Uh, Instagram, where I use more Z Dials underscore Real Estate, and that's really about it, man. I don't have all the other, you know, I don't have anything else other than outside. I have a Facebook page, Facebook business, uh, Facebook.com backslash tackle uh, tackling your real estate, tackle real estate, and um, that's really it. At this, you know. All right, so wrapping it up. If you like what you saw here today. Please give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment. If you have something that you want to ask Zach personally, I'm sure he'll uh, write back to you. And um, I think that's a wrap.